wonder what your reflections are on your childhood. What are your reflections on your own parenting? I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s, and I think the parenting kind of phrase that was used for that age was the latch key parenting. That is, parents are so busy and they were never at home that what happened was you were given a key and uh, you would let yourself in and then you would look after yourself all afternoon until your parents arrived. How things have changed. I wonder if you've heard of the helicopter parent. Or seen the helicopter parent. You know, the ones that just tend to hover around schools, they swoop in at any hint of trouble. Any trouble that might be there with their grades or too much work or anything, there they are at the front office of a school, the helicopter parent. Maybe it's not the helicopter parent, but the tiger parent. You know, those ones that roll out that tough love, that strict and demanding, that makes academic and extracurricular school activities a high priority. Make sure that they're going to all, they're getting their goals using academics, they're going to endless coaching, tiger parenting. Maybe there's the bulldozer parent. That's the one I've just heard of recently, where they will push any obstacle in the road that might frustrate or set back their child, that everything is levelled nice and smooth, so that the child's journey through life, especially academically, is levelled. Now, here's another one I haven't, I've only just heard of as well. The term the elephant parent refers to those who is very nurturing, protective, and tends to focus on the emotions of his or her child over academic or athletic success. I was reading one book, All This Over Parenting, that seems to be happening at the moment, is creating the bonsai child. According to Judith Locke, parents are making their lives too easy by doing too much for them and giving too much to them. Their child is confined to ideal conditions, incapable of coping in the real world because in the end they are stunted. It's fun thinking about those things, isn't it? What type of parenting we had, what type of parents we are, where we kind of lean. But I know as I approach this topic... It's actually going to be a swirl of emotions for all of us. For some, it's going to be great, great pain. The loss of a parent. The loss of a child. Abuse. Neglect. Moments of wakeful nights. of moments of our children moving away from Christ. Great sadnesses and frustrations and difficulties. Yet as a parent, in the midst of it, there's also great joys, isn't it? I remember holding my little children in those first moments of life, looking into their little eyes, having their little hands wrapped around your finger, looking at their little toes and how precious, so very precious they are. For some, it has been a great, great joy. For others, great sadness thinking about this topic. We live in an anxious times. Things are changing rapidly, aren't they? Technology. (laughs) And so now the kids that are the experts in technology, it makes us kind of a little fearful at times. There's all these things of children suffering the effects of lockdown, the rise of mental health. So many 
things going on. I wish I had all the answers. In fact, as I was going over and preparing this sermon, I realized just how poorly at times I've done. Fortunately, we've got a great God. A God who speaks into all moments. For those who have joined us, as Mickey has just said, we're looking at this great book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul wrote it, and, and he starts by opening up this cosmic plan of peace and grace. The way that God is going to unite all things in and through Jesus, his precious blood. He's going to bring forgiveness of sins and bring a people for himself. Paul shows how this grand cosmic plan then works itself out in the daily walk of his people. Last week we looked at the way that he, that he focused in on marriages. And this week, a message for children and parents. Here Paul brings the words of God, the wisdom of eternity, to bear on this very domestic and humble moment of parenting and being a child. Two weeks ago, we were encouraged to watch how we walked, to be filled with the Spirit, to be submitting to one another, all done in the fear of the Lord, all done in light of what Christ has done for us. So what does it look like for children and parents? Well, let me read to you again. It would be good if you had your Bibles open uh, to have a look at it. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Two things to note to start with. The first thing, how extraordinary that Paul should address children. Children have been included in the instructions here. Now, if you know your Roman history and the times that they were, uh, children were, were callously, uh, callous and cruelty towards them. The unwanted babies were abandoned and weak and deformed ones killed. Even children regard as, as nuisances. But here, at the beginning of these instructions to parents and children, children are first. It means that children were a part of that service. Uh, children are a part of that church. Where Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of God, and whoever receives one in my name receives me. This radical change has happened. The church embraces children. The second thing, helpful thing to note is, is when we say the word child, uh, it probably has... Uh, a note of not looking at necessarily um, an age, but a relationship. So in the end, all of us are children, aren't we? We're all children of our birth parents and those that raised us. But as we look through these verses, in particular four, it's clear that the parents are giving discipline and instruction. It's, it's obviously that Paul has in mind here those young ones that need discipline and instruction. So I take it, Paul at this point is talking to children, those young children who are in the care of their parents. And what's the first instruction to them? They are to obey. And the way it's written here, it's this absolute obedience. It comes from this word, the word there has these two ideas, the words are under and to listen. That is, a child was to listen under. They were to be conscientious listeners. But isn't that the way? Haven't you had these moments? Listen to me. No, really, listen to me what I'm saying to you. Come on, all of us have heard it, haven't you? We've either spoken it or said it. We want our kids to listen, not just listen, but then to obey and do. but it's not a blind obedience. Paul lays down for us some foundations here, some, by, some grounds by which children are to obey their parents. Notice there in that verse, in the Lord. 
part of Christian discipleship, part of what it is to be a parent, what it was is for the child was to do it because of their Lord, Jesus. That is, they're they're not obeying their parents primarily because of the authority or status, although that's part of it. Primarily, they're obeying their parents because they are of their respect of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, it's worth noting at this point. If a parent should make their child obey them in something that is morally wrong, the child ought not to obey it. Because primarily, it is they are serving Christ. Listening to what Christ has to say. Following his words. Children were to obey because of Christ. I know at this point, there there will be people in this room who have had abusive parents. Who have had parents that have made them do terrible things. It's not right. Can I encourage you? Talk to someone about that. We are to serve our Christ, serve Christ first and foremost. That's one foundation that Paul puts here. It's in the Lord. But note there, it's because obedience uh, for this is right. Virtually every culture and every society recognises and indeed built on the premise that children are to respect and obey their parents. It's kind of like woven into the fabric of life that God has woven there. But I take it, it's right because God said so. God has said that children are to obey their parents. This is what the Lord expects. And it kind of leads us into the next couple of verses where Paul brings in one of the commandments of the Ten Commandments. Let me read it for you. Honour your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Notice here, Paul tells uh, children to honour their parents. Uh, This idea of honouring reinforces the instructions to obey parents, but it goes beyond that. To honour our parents means to love them, to regard them highly, to show respect and consideration for them. Now, while we may be called to obey our parents when we're young, there comes a point where we we leave home. We may outgrow our call to obey our parents, but we will never outgrow our obligation to honour them. If You have parents, honour them. For children living at home, it meant obeying their parents, but for adult children who left home, it means being respectful, have a respectful attitude and caring for them. It means in their old age in particular, where we care for our parents I remember for myself having a father who died of cancer but seeing it as a great privilege of caring for him in those final moments, of picking him up when he collapsed in the shower, of caring and loving him. We are to honour our parents. But note there that this honouring of our parents, which links in with the obeying, Paul notes here, this is the first commandment with a promise. Uh, If you go through, if you know your Ten Commandments, uh, this comes at number five, uh, where there is this promise that it might go well with you. Now, if you know your Bibles really well, you'll note that there's a kind of similar one on the second. That is, uh, God will, let me read it for you. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or anything or anything that is in heaven above. And then he goes on to say, uh, 
For I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children of the third and fourth generation. And then he goes on saying, showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love him and keep my commandments. It appears that here in number two, maybe this is a promise here as well. But it seems more likely that this, that second commandment, is really describing the character of God. So when we get to number five, there is this extraordinary promise. I mean, it's an extraordinary promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live a long, live long in the land. What an extraordinary promise that Paul brings for us here. A remarkable promise of full life. And doesn't this kind of make sense? If a child was to listen to their parents, doesn't it bring uh, life and life to the full. Uh, think about the warnings that you have for them of the dangers of the sharp knives, of the, the high trees or whatever it happens to be that might harm them. Uh, for the incident, uh, for, the, for sparing them for the bad habits they might have or the friends that might tend to ruin or shorten their life. Or the way that we can help develop healthy character traits. There is blessing by obeying your parents. I think rather than the way that Paul has written it here, rather than interpret it as an in individual terms, there is this promise that kind of, that society and so, the stability of, of our social communities, which honour our parents, there is a great health in them. And indeed, without a strong family life, it tends to crumble a little. I read only this week of a lecturer who's come to Sydney who's written a book on the fall of Christendom. Uh, the way that Christianity seems to be going down in numbers, and you look over since the, uh, you know, the, the, the huge numbers of Christians, Christians that are moving away. And she notes that some people think it's because of, uh, you know, our riches, that our riches draw us away, our decadence. But she makes a case that as the family unit breaks down, so does our society. Hear this warning, though. We cannot apply this meticulously in every single case. Hear me carefully. Like any proverb, this is to be understood as a general pattern. There are always exceptions in the midst of that. And those who are in this audience will know that of times where there isn't necessarily great blessing and long life. But as a general rule, there is blessing for children who obey their parents. Well, for those of us who are children here, and for our children, obedience to our parents is something that we are called to do. But as we've been looking through this book of Ephesians, our relationships have been transformed because of Jesus. We are in the Lord. We've been told rather than kind of curving in on ourselves. Instead, we are to instead be uh, those who submit to others in Christ's love and peace. Christian children learn to obey with gladness, for this pleases the Lord. Well, some words to parents, in particular, fathers. If Christian children are exhorted to render obedience to their parents, then parents, especially fathers, are told not to provoke their children to anger, but instead to bring their sons and daughters in the training and instruction of the Lord. Note here two parts. There's the negative, then the positive. Parents are not to provoke their children to anger. I've got a list of what this might look like. Number one, constantly making and breaking promises. How unlike God the Father. Crushing discipline, discipline that can be physical, but it must be never be violent. Disciplining out of fury, it not only doesn't work, it's a sin. Being inconsistent, rules which change from day to day. 
Too much of our discipline rides on the wave of our emotions. Punishing children when you have no evidence, so end up punishing the innocent. Children will remember that injustice for a long time. Incessant nagging. We don't like it when our spouse does it, so why should our children? If we keep up on their backs about every little thing, they will think that not putting the lid on the peanut butter is as serious as lying. Qualified love. I love you if, too many of us teach teach grace with our words and then deny it by our actions. Use your children's failure to use your children's failure to display love. Embarrassing them. Now this one I found particularly difficult. I always thought it was kind of a dad's right to embarrass their children. But no. Embarrassing them. Not good. Never embarrass your children in front of their friends or others. Not spending time with them. Being one thing at home and another in the world. Asking the impossible. Favoritism. Not saying sorry. Focusing on behaviour at the expense of their heart. Our children are beautiful flowers. And they are easily crushed. It's interesting that fathers in particular are made aware of this. And how they are expected uh, to care for their children. They are not to be manipulated, exploited or crushed. But instead, help to bring to full blossom. Paul brings here three points of the way that we can help them in a positive way. The first is, he says there in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Note the first part there, but bring them up. The word here has this idea of nourishing. And back in 529, it's in relation to Christ nourishing the church. That is, we are to provide food, to, to love and care for them. Not to stand back, but invest time and energy into our children. Fathers in particular. Whether you're holding babies in your arms, loving them in their school days, or hugging their teenager or grown son. I remember my dad showed me this beautifully. He came from a broken family. He came from a place where his father walked out on him and his five sisters when he was only eight years old. My father took it upon himself every night to make sure that when he said goodnight to me, would give me a hug and a kiss. When I got to year 12, much to my shame, I thought I was too old to be hugging and kissing my dad. And so one night, I came down determined. Dad said, good night. I stuck out my hand. Good night, Dad. It just crushed him. Just crushed him. What an idiot. (laughs) Some weeks later, when I came to my realisation what an idiot I was, I um, went back to kissing him and hugging him and did so to the end of my days, his days. We are to nourish our children, bring them up. How? How? with discipline and instruction. Discipline has this strong idea of correction. Uh, We see it a lot in the uh, Proverbs, don't we? Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. For the moment of all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. So Hebrews encourages us. Discipline produces practical righteousness. It produces peace 
and shalom and well-being and wholeness. It is instruction spoken, truth spoken in love. A love that puts boundaries. A love that corrects. Grunch's talk this morning was actually a similar talk to what I heard when I was a kid. I remember the, uh, the lady, she was talking about parents who discipline you and that it was good, and that our parents loved us, and in fact, we should say thanks. So I went home that afternoon. I don't know what I did. I did something wrong. I got a smack from my mum. In the midst of my tears, I turned to her and said, Thanks, Mum. <laughs> to which she smacked me again. <laughs> we are to speak truth in love, to discipline our children. Uh, we also to instruct them. Uh, the word instruct there literally means to place before the mind the verbal instructions or warnings. Note here there are both positive instruction, that discipline and instruction are both positive for correction, but also correction when mistakes are made. Note also the very final words. This discipline and instruction which parents are to give is further described as of the Lord. The ultimate concern of parents is not simply that their sons and daughters will be obedient to their authority, but through godly training and correction, their children will come to know and obey the Lord himself. Well, what a contrast with norms of Paul's day. Paul wants Christian fathers in particular to be gentle and patient educators of their children, whose chief uh, weapon, in many ways, is Christian instruction focused on Jesus Christ. Paul had written earlier in this letter, in chapter 3, that we heard just a moment ago, that, that fatherhood is all derived from the one God and Father of us all. And that God's mighty work of reconciling in his son had been effected in order to form one multinational, multicultural family of God. Therefore, fathers, let human fathers then care for their families as God the Father cares for his. As I finish up, thinking about Disciplining and instruction. A key way that we can do that is here. For while the parents are primary spiritual givers for their children, Paul is writing this to a church, that a church might rally around and care for children and parents and spur them on. Therefore, keep coming to church. Bring your kids to church. This sets a tone for life. I know it's hard getting your kids here, particularly when they become teenagers trying to get them up in the morning. But this is what it is to be a part of God's family. Be intentional about it because there's great blessing in that. I know of many of you who your children have ministered to my children. And it brings tears to my eyes. And I'm so thankful for it. Because we need God's help in the midst of all this, where we trust and lean on him. So let me come before our great God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we need your help. Please help us to be good children, to be good parents ones that bring honour and glory to our Lord Jesus. Please help us, we pray. Amen.